Uh, I appreciate you giving me some time uh, to talk about issues that I think we 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 all we all care about. Um, I'm going to talk for about uh, 40 minutes, I think, 35, 40 minutes. Uh, I think that's about the um, that's about the limit. That's long enough on a on a Zoom platform. And uh, I, then I look forward to hearing your comments and questions. Uh, I've talked a lot about the book I'm going to be talking about this evening over the last year and a half. And for me, the always the most interesting moments of these presentations are the are the Q and A, the questions and answers, uh, because my book touches on uh, so many aspects of economics and politics in America, past, present, and future. I am a historian, uh, and and so um, my ability to predict the future is not that strong. Of course, none of us can really, uh, with confidence, predict the future. But the nature of my book is such that it always ends up uh, with us pondering what America will be like over the next 10 years or so uh, in what is a very confusing, chaotic, and volatile moment. So I, I welcome questions about past, present, and future. The book I want to talk with you about is The Rise and Fall of the Neoliberal Order, America and the World during the free market era it was initially published in 2022. The paperback edition just came out uh, a few months ago. Uh, and uh, it is a history of economics and politics and a good bit of culture too uh, over the last um, 80 years. The core of the book focuses on what I consider to be the free market or neoliberal era approximately from 19... 70 to 2016 until the election of, of Donald Trump. But the book also includes uh, two chapters on what I call the New Deal order, the which the 40-year period of politics and economics that preceded the free market era, the neoliberal era. Uh, and I want to start by doing some definitional work with you because there are a few words in the title that uh, are not words that Americans are used to using in their common language, although that I think is now beginning to change. Uh, and two of the words are political order. I talk about the rise and fall of the neoliberal order. What is a political order? And then I want to talk with you um, a bit about why I use the word neoliberalism uh, to talk about the free market era. So I want to do some definitional work first, and then I want to take you through a lot of history of, over the last uh, 50 years. Most discussion of American politics revolves around two, four, and six-year political cycles. We are gearing up for the four-year political cycle, also known as the election of 2024, which, as you all know, in America, elections go on forever. Uh, it's a question of whether they ever stop. Um, and because elections are so important and because they are so intense and so in, involving and in, enveloping, so much political commentary focuses on the two, four, and six-year election cycles. It's as if everything that's important in American politics happens within these cycles. But that is not the case. There are certain trends in politics and economics that cannot be comprehended in two, four, and six-year election cycles. And my concept of political orders is meant to help us understand how certain tendencies in American politics come to be dominant over longer stretches of time, for 30 or 40 years. For a political order to succeed, a political party must achieve enduring influence through a constellation of constituencies, policy networks, think tanks, and media platforms, all harnessed to promote a particular ideology, especially in regard to political economy. There was a Democratic Party-led New Deal order that arose in the 1930s and 40s under Franklin Roosevelt, crested in the 1950s and 60s, and fell apart in the 1970s. And there was a Republican-led neoliberal order that emerged in the 1970s and 80s, 
Reagan was its principal architect. Crested in the 1990s and 2000s, Bill Clinton, the Democrat, was a key facilitator of this neoliberal order. And that political order, the neoliberal order, has now fractured. And we are living in a time without political order. I think we can all feel that in our bones. Uh, and at some point, a new political order will arise, but it has not yet arisen. The core idea of the New Deal order was that capitalism, left to its own devices, was destructive and therefore had to be managed by a powerful federal state acting in the public interest. The core idea of the neoliberal order was that government restrictions and controls had to be stripped away and the animal spirits of markets released in order for capitalism to flourish. The core idea of the neoliberal order, stripping away government restrictions and controls, was not just a national vision, it was a global vision. It was an effort to unleash free market capitalism upon the entire world. The ideological influence of a political order is discernible not simply in the frequency of its triumph at the polls, but also in its ability to spread its core ideas through the ranks of ostensible political opposition. For instance, Republican Dwight D. Eisenhower became president in 1952 after 20 consecutive years of the Democrats being in power from 1932 to 1952. For a Republican to come into office after the Democrats have been in power for 20 years, one might have expected Dwight Eisenhower to have dismantled what the Democrats had done. One would have expected him to have dismantled the New Deal, but he did not. Instead, he and the Republican Party accepted the core principles of the New Deal as their own. What did it mean to accept the principles of the New Deal as their own. It meant accepting the existence of a welfare state. It meant existing, ex accepting a strong labor movement backed up by government guarantees of the rights of workers to organize and bargain collectively with their employers. And it also meant uh, accepting a taxation state that if you supported this today as a Republican would get you tossed not simply out of the Republican Party, but out of the United States of America. The highest marginal tax rate that Eisenhower signed on to in 1954 was 91%. A Republican president signing on to a, the highest tax on the, the tax on the highest marginal group, a tax rate of 91%. It's an extraordinary statement of acceptance uh, and acquiescence. And if any Republican tried to do that today, in fact, if any Democrat tried to do that today, they'd be tossed out of politics, put on a boat, and sent to Cuba. Uh, so part of what I try to understand in the book is why Eisenhower accepts the principles that he ostensibly opposes. And this, I, and in that acceptance, I discern the power of a political order, its power ideologically to compel those who wish to be at the center of politics to accept certain principles of political economy. In my book, I call Bill Clinton the Democratic Eisenhower because during his presidency, he spearheaded a campaign to get the Democratic Party to acquiesce to the core economic principles of Reaganism. That meant deregulating the economy at home, especially in telecommunications, electricity, and finance. It meant globalizing the doctrine of free trade. One could argue that Clinton's deregulatory policies went further than those of Reagan himself. In other words, in some respects, Clinton did more to release free market forces from government controls than Reagan himself had done. Admittedly, Clinton was operating in a tough political environment, but his willingness to acquiesce to Reaganite 
principles of political economy, economy of free market capitalism illustrates my point about a political order. Once a political order is established, it constrains political choice and achievable policy options. The political orders that I study extend across decades. They cannot be understood within two, four, and six year election cycles. And part of the contribution of my book is to plead for recognizing that there are certain trends in American politics and, and in economics that transcend elections, that transcend parties, that transcend decades. So that's a bit of introduction to how I think about political orders. Now, some of you may be wondering about my use of the term neoliberal. Why call a political order a neoliberal order? That is a term that is not used much in America, although that is now beginning to change. Brooke uh, sent me a piece by Chris Murphy uh, um, in Congress, uh, who has begun himself to talk extensively about neoliberalism and the need to move away from neoliberal economic policies. So the term is catching on. But some of you might be wondering, why not call a pro-capitalist order a conservative order? Did not Reagan call himself a conservative? And the answer to that is yes, he did. So why don't I call the political order that dominated from the 1980s through the 20 teens? Why do I not call it a conservative order? Here's why. Conservatism in classical terms connotes a high regard for tradition, order, and hierarchy for continuing to do things the way they've always been done. In a conservative regime, you can have change, but change must be done organically, slowly, and with proper regard for traditional ways of doing things. There are profoundly conservative elements in American politics and in American culture. Witness white Southern reactions to the civil rights movement in the 1960s and 70s. Witness efforts to turn back liberation movements undertaken by women, gays, and racial minorities, and to restore the priority of the patriarchal family, heterosexuality, and white supremacy. Those are conservative elements of our society then and still are today. And the term conservative should be applied to those movements. But the term conservatism does not do a good job capturing the innovation and disruption that unleashing capitalism's power entails. Releasing market power does as much to upend tradition, order, and hierarchy as to sustain it. Capitalism, free of constraints, is restless, disruptive, innovative, and unsettling without any regard for traditional ways of doing things. For an example of such disruption, think of what Uber has done to the taxi cab industry. I'm still, my heart is still with the taxi cab drivers. <laughs> And it always will be, but oh my God, have they, if you think about how Uber has taken a very powerful industry and completely disrupted its ways of doing business, put aside for a moment whether you think it's a good or bad thing, but if you contemplate the disruption, the innovation, the restlessness, the unsettling character of that change, it's profoundly capitalistic and does not fit neatly into a conservative box. Uh, Adam Smith, uh, the great Scottish political economist of the 18th century and a champion of free markets, called his movement to free capitalism from its constraints, liberalism. That's what he understood by liberalism. By calling the late 20th century uh, ne neoliberalism, the political order of the late 20th century neoliberalism or new liberalism, we focus 
attention on the capitalist transformation that was central to it. That capitalist transformation, until recently, has been given short shrift by historians who are much more comfortable talking about the genuinely conservative elements in American politics, Southern reactions to civil rights, efforts to turn back liberation movements, efforts to eliminate uh, the right to abortion, freedom to choose. And historians, my colleagues uh, in England and in the United States, have done not nearly as good a job charting the capitalist transformation that has happened as a result of freeing markets from constraints during the neoliberal era. And my project in my book is to understand that freeing from constraints and all the consequences and impl implications uh, it has had on economics, on politics, and on culture. Now, defining uh, neoliberalism in terms of freedom con from constraints um, raises a question of its connection to the classical liberalism of Adam Smith in the 18th century. And here I depart from, I depart company from many who write about neoliberalism who see in it only a regime of coercion to enforce the imperatives of capitalism on the poor, on the marginal, on those unable themselves to amass wealth. Now, there is plenty of coercion in my rendition of the rise of the neoliberal order. There is plenty of coercion in the story I tell about the capitalist transformation that was at the center of that political order. But it wasn't just coercion. Many who inhabited the neoliberal world were seeking to connect their neoliberalism, their new liberalism, to the older dream of em emancipation that had incubated under classical liberalism. Adam Smith, back to the 18th century, wanted to free people from what he regarded as the heavy hand of the state. This was the British state, and it, my God, it had a heavy hand. Monarchs, aristocrats, mercantilists, mercantilists being those who wanted to control every aspect of trade, who could trade with whom and for how long and under what circumstances all meant to enrich the monarch and not much more. Adam Smith wanted to free people from all these regulations. Uh, he wanted them to be able to truck, barter and exchange as they saw fit. He saw in this program of freeing economics from the state, he saw it a, as a program of emancipation. Now, this dream of emancipation historically over the 19th and 20th century did a lot more to emancipate capital than to emancipate the working man and woman. Capitalism turns out to be much better at generating wealth than at distributing wealth in some kind of equitable manner much better at generating fortune and capital than it is in making the value of a relatively flat economic distribution a centerpiece of the economy. That's not what capitalists do. Nevertheless, this dream of emancipating capital was a powerful one. And if we are to understand neoliberalism's power, especially in the United States, then we have to understand the mobilizing power of this dream to free people from constraints, to free people from institutions telling them what they wanted to do. It is what drew people in the United States to neoliberalism on the left as well as on the right. It is what gave this creed a popular appeal and a popular base. Now, I say it appealed to people on the left as well as on the right. This has turned out to be a somewhat controversial point in my book, and it's something that we may want to discuss in the Q&A. You might be wondering what I mean. When I say it was appealing to the left as well as the right, I have in mind the new left of the 1960s and 70s, and judging by the age of some of you listeners who I can see, 
quite similar to my own age. You may remember the new left. When I talk about the new left to young people, they think Bernie Sanders and everything and Occupy Wall Street. That's not what I'm talking about in terms of the new left. I'm talking about the new left of the 1960s and 70s. And that new left was critical not just of capitalism and corporations. It was critical of all large institutions that were thought to be stultifying of individual freedom. And if any of you were in the ambient circles of the new left of, the, of those years, you know what I'm talking about. And they targeted not just corporations, but they also targeted government. And they talked a lot about the system crushing the individual spirit. What did they mean by the system? They talked about the system all the time, and most of the time didn't bother to define it. But the system was an unholy alliance between big government and big corporations that was squishing the individuality of people. The One of the um, slogans of the free speech movement at Berkeley in 1964, one of the first mass moments of the new left, was the declaration that appeared on posters everywhere, I will not be folded, spindled, or mutilated. I like to ask students where that comes from. They have no idea. This is from the, the age of programming where every step in a program had to be put on a separate punch card. Remember, we had armies of um, of key punch operators who had to turn, turn these things out. And on every one of those cards, it said, do not fold, spindle, or mutilate. It was a slogan that peop that young people of the 60s were intimately familiar with. And their oppression was not just economic, and for people at Berkeley, it was not primarily economic. It was spiritual. It was it was the there was uh, them being crushed by large institutions, including their own university, the University of California, or the University of Wisconsin, where the New Left was also extremely strong, University of Michigan as well. And this was a left that sought to free itself from constraints. The early personal computer movement, Steve Jobs and his buddies, they were all tree huggers, they were all hippies. Uh, the, they wanted to target IBM in the mainframe. The personal computer was going to be an agent of uh, unprecedented personal freedom. This was the dream of the cyberspace and the internet. And so, yes, this dream of freeing people from constraints came from the left as well as the right, which is what part of what made the appeal of neoliberalism in the 1970s and 80s and 90s so strong. We may want to talk about that uh, later. Uh, and the uh, Apple began, uh, you know, the vision for Apple began with Steve Jobs when he was hugging trees at Reed College in the 1960s. It's now one of the most powerful corporations in the world uh, and, and exercises, in my opinion, way too much power over way too many things. Uh, but be, it began with the dream of a kind of personal emancipation, which is which helped neoliberalism take root among many different constituencies in American society. Okay, back with a few more words about political orders. As I've indicated earlier, I am interested in moments of acquiescence on the part of opposition parties to a reigning political order. I'm interested in why Dwight Eisenhower accepted the principles of the New Deal. I'm interested in why Bill Clinton accepted the principles of Reaganism. Uh, and this was not just to internal factors. Uh, part of the story I tell is about the rise and fall of communism on the world stage, a mortal enemy of the United States, uh, a society organized economically in a radically different way than America organized its own society. Uh, and the Soviet Union, global communism, was thought to pose such a threat to the prosperity and the free functioning of capitalism that all kinds of resources had to mobilize, had to be mobilized to contain it. And that meant if we want to understand why Eisenhower um, was willing to accept a strong labor movement, was willing to accept a strong welfare state, was willing to accept 91% taxation rates on the richest Americans. It's because the 
Soviet Union and global communism threatened the United States, not just militarily, mil militarily but ideologically, as being an alternative system of organizing economic life and political life that stood as an existential threat to all things that Americans held dear. And so for the sake of containing communism, the Republican Party was willing to make compromises that I think it otherwise would not have been willing to make. By the same token, the fall of the Soviet Union and the fall of the dream of communism in 1989 to 1991 helps us to understand why uh, Clinton felt he had no alternative but to accept free market capitalism as the only way of organizing the entire world. And so I situate the story of America and this broader international story of this epic conflict between capitalism and communism. And as long as com communism was strong in the world, the New Deal order prospered. And when it was in retreat and then it collapsed, it facilitated the triumph of free markets everywhere in the world. If I'm interested in moments when political orders consolidate themselves, I'm also interested in moments when political orders come apart. And the coming apart of political orders is usually associated with moments of economic crisis. The economic crisis of the Great Depression ushered in the New Deal order. The deep recession of the 1970s, the so-called stagflation, brought down the New Deal order and created an opening for the neoliberal order. And the neoliberal order fractured in the decade after the great financial crash of 2008, 2009. So if we're looking for pivot points of transition from one political order to another, my attention is drawn to the great economic crises of the last hundred years, the Great Depression of the 30s, uh, the Great Recession, the Deep Recession of the 1970s, and the Great Financial Crash of 2008-2009. Economic crises lead to very material and hardships that are both widespread and severe. And in these moments of economic crisis, people are willing to contemplate ideas formerly regarded as heterodox, unworkable, uh, excessively and maybe dangerously radical, certainly dangerous to prevailing orthodoxies. Consider the neoliberals who came to power or who gained influence in the 1980s and 1990s. Brooke mentioned one of them, the inimitable Milton Friedman. Another one was Friedrich von Hayek, the Austrian economist, who probably did more than anyone else to set forth the principles of neoliberalism in the 1930s and 40s. M Milton Friedman, Hayek, and the Ch Chicago School of Economics, if you've heard of that, became extraordinarily influential in the 1980s and 1990s. But what's interesting to me is not just their success in the 1980s and 1990s, but their utter failure for 30 years prior to that time. Milton Friedman didn't begin preaching free market ideology in the 1980s and 90s. He'd been doing that since the 1940s. Friedrich von Hayek had been doing it uh, since the 1930s. They were utterly irrelevant to political economy and politics in America in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Utterly, utterly irrelevant. Only in the 1970s, amidst the economic crisis of the 1970s, do their ideas have a chance to migrate from the margins into the center. And it is the economic crisis and the willingness to contemplate heterodox ideas because the orthodox ideas are no longer working. It is in these moments of crisis that ideas consigned to the margins have a chance to bid for mainstream support. Or take the 20 teens, a moment when the neoliberal order is coming apart, specifically 2016. Let's pause for a moment and think about Donald Trump on the right and Bernie Sanders 
on the left. In political terms, they were espousing ideas that had that had changed little in their own minds since the 1980s and 1990s. Trump had been suspicious of globalization, free trade, skeptical, skeptical virtue of market freedom. He didn't really believe in the beauty of markets. Markets were things to be manipulated. There was nothing perfect about them. He, he had been saying this for 30 years. And for 29 of those years, his ideas in politics were considered to be nuts. The same with Bernie Sanders. You know, Bernie Sanders, part of his appeal in 2016 was his authenticity. He was saying what he believed. He had been saying those same things for 30 years. But in the 1990s, who was Bernie Sanders? Uh, he was a lone socialist in Congress, first a congressman, then a senator. To Clinton, to Bush, he was no more than a fly, a pest that occasionally had to be whisked away when he buzzed too close to their ears. He was not someone who had to be taken ser seriously. Suddenly in 2016, these two marginal figures in American politics, Trump on the right, Sanders on the left, became the two most dynamic and rele relevant figures in American politics. And Hillary Clinton never know what hit her in 2016. The heir apparent still operating within a neoliberal paradigm. If we ask about what was the nature of her disorientation, why did she not know what hit her? What hit her? Part of her disorientation was had to do with a political order in which she had come to power now coming apart. And so ideas that she had accepted as rational, appealing, she couldn't really understand why they were not gaining traction anymore. One way of understanding how much uh, neoliberal ideology plunged into crisis in 2016 and the years after is to um, consider the fate of the, what I sometimes call the four freedoms of neoliberalism. Now, these four freedoms of neoliberalism are not Franklin Delano Roosevelt's social democratic freedoms of 1941. They are something else. These four freedoms are the free movement of people, the free movement of goods, the free movement of information, and the free movement of capital. When the neoliberal order was riding high, it would, these were articles of faith. People had to, be, had to be able to move freely across borders. Goods had to be able to move freely across borders without restraint. Information had to be able to move. Capital had to be able to move. From 2016 forward, each of these freedoms came under severe challenge. It's most obvious in the case of migration, walls going up everywhere to stop people crossing from one country to another. In terms of goods, if you got labeled a protectionist in America in 2000, 2005, 1995, you were out of politics. You could not be a protectionist. Free trade was a gospel of the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. And a world of free trade was seen as a world of affluence, uh, a world of economic growth, a world in which everyone would prosper, protectionism would, under, would interfere with that dream. Suddenly, the two most dynamic players in American politics are both protectionists, Donald Trump on the right, Bernie Sanders on the left. Or think of the free movement of information and the, in, the ability to be anywhere in the world and to get information instantaneously every moment of the day and night from anyone Anywhere. This was the dream of the internet revolution. This was thought to be a permanent development. But what is China doing in the 20 teens? It is building a digital wall around its borders. And it is only allowing into its, its digital territory those who will obey the dictates of the Chinese government. We are close to entering a digital Cold War in which rival blocs have their own digital systems competing against each other. This is not the neoliberal vision. And 
since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we have seen the most intense form of capital controls slapped on a country, in this case, Russia, that we have seen in 50 years. So we are seeing the fraying of a set of ideas that were seen as being central to the neoliberal ascendancy, the neoliberal order coming apart in the 20 teens, which is which brings us to the present moment. Let me say a few words about the present moment and what may lie ahead. And then I um, will turn it over to you for your questions. There are three possibilities of our present and future. One is a Trump style regime that is authoritarian and ethno-nationalist. We recognize this every day, it's on display and it represents a very real possibility. We have to acknowledge that Trump could very well win in 2024. Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders um, are have been developing a progressive political order that resembles the New Deal. And there have been very significant steps taken in that direction. Uh, and th this is a direction that centers on these relate to Brooks' initial comments, making the government a major player in the economy uh, and not just to stimulate growth, but to undertake projects that the private sector cannot be relied on to undertake itself. Uh, they include massive investments in physical infrastructure. They include the biggest commitment the United States has ever made to green energy. And they include uh, a effort to reshore the manufacture of computer chips to lessen America's dependence on Taiwan, which of course is vulnerable to Chinese invasion. This has required rehabilitating the government as a positive force in economic life uh, and uh, establishing the principle that states must bend markets to serve the public interest, which is much closer to the spirit of the New Deal than to the spirit of the neoliberal order. And that possibility is real. If Biden wins in 2024, we are going to see tremendous progress toward that um, progressive political order that incubates principles that were central to the New Deal. The third possibility is that no new political order emerges, that the country is simply too divided, that neither party can amass enough votes to win consecutive elections and to implant its political will and ideology. I do not regard a politics in America without order as, as something to be um, uh, admired. I think it's very dangerous because it's a recipe for frustration, paralysis, and conveys a sense that democratic government in America is incapable of giving the people of America what they need in order to prosper, be safe, uh, and uh, feel good and proud of their country. And I think over the long term, a situation of political disorder is going to favor Trump style authoritarianism and ethno nationalism over the progressive politics of a Biden Sanders. I think I'm going to stop there with just putting those three possibilities before you uh, and invite your questions um, about what I've discussed over the last um, 40 minutes. And please feel free to enter any part of the story I put in front of you, which really extends from the 1930s to the 2020s, uh, a period of 90 years. And I look forward to your thoughts, comments, and questions. Thank you for listening. Thank you much, Gary. Uh, my head is reeling. I'm sure everybody else is, is, is too. Um, I don't see any questions yet. And Thomas, 
Uh, are there folks there that might have a question to no, start? A oh, hold on, I have one here. Peg, right. if you want to shout it out yourself, you can, or I can, I can read it. Um, yeah, I can write this back to my notes. Oh, yes, yes, I can. Okay, so we have we have one question here. What is the connection between neoliberalism and the libertarian? Um, good question. Um, libertarians uh, really see um, no role for the state at all, for government at all, except to provide at at a, at a very minimal level um, security, personal safety, policing functions, uh, a, a state really minimal in its capacity, individuals uh, being free to live their lives pretty much as they wish to live them with very little in the way of, of government support. Neoliberals are somewhat different uh, than libertarians. There's not a natural affinity between the two groups. Uh, neoliberals recognize that markets, they, they are focused first and foremost on markets, and they recognize that markets are complex organisms that don't arise in nature, and that strong governments and strong states are required uh, to um, set up markets and ensure they're smooth running. So for example, um, neoliberals don't ex object to the Federal Reserve as, as a kind of central bank. That's a state institution. Uh, they recognize that uh, there's, there needs to be an institution that controls the money supply, that raises interest rates, that lowers interest rates, that this kind of fine-tuning of the economy is quite necessary for market capitalism to flourish. The truest libertarian in Congress is probably Rand Paul. And if he had his way, he would eliminate the Federal Reserve tomorrow because he does not want that kind of centralized control over market activity. And I would put Rand Paul in a libertarian category, whereas someone who is a true neoliberal say, would say, we need the Federal Reserve to organize markets so that they can fun function freely. Now, there's something contradictory and paradoxical about needing government authority to organize markets so they can function freely. But that is the world in which we live. And neoliberals would say that that it that is part of government's role, that uh, to establish rules of exchange, um, to uh, have some instruments for adjusting market conditions so as to ensure that they will run as smoothly as possible. So the principal difference is that Neoliberals accord a role for government in ensuring the free functioning of markets, whereas libertarians see no role for government in that activity at all. We have another one here. I see one online also, um, but... Kent, I'll let you go ahead and shout yours out. I think we can hear you fine. Your, your, your political order were all based upon economic theory, and no quarrel with that. But is it possible that a new political order could be established around some discipline other than economics, uh, social equality, freedom, um, as opposed to the economic implications of, of having the, the political order? That's a really interesting question. Um, the, the two political orders that I have studied most deeply uh, have a program of political economy at their core, which acts as a kind of glue to 
um, to to um, allow uh, a polity to deliver things to its citizenry that 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 they want. So the past two political orders have had a profound program of political economy, and I do think that a new political order, if, if it establishes itself, will require something similar as well. But I will add to that that a successful political order, and here's where Brooks' American Studies background comes becomes important, has to have a good story to tell. Uh, and it has to... Um, uh, ab about the uh, about what they are doing, not just in economic terms, but in terms of values that Americans admire uh, and take to heart. Uh, the neoliberal order at the heart of it was Ronald Reagan, who for whom the most important word was freedom. Uh, and we can quarrel with. Uh, how he um, deployed freedom during his presidency, and who he gave freedom, who he gave freedom to, and who he took freedom away from. But if you look at his speeches, um, freedom is all over his his speeches. Freedom as the birthright of the American nation, born in the American Revolution. He had a particular story to tell about freedom, which was that. People enjoyed the greatest freedom when government was small and people were free of government tyranny. And his greatest fear was the greatest government tyranny of the 20th century, which for him was the Soviet Union and communism. But he had a story of, of he, he told stories of freedom. He didn't, he, didn't, um, he didn't just go out to the American people and say, we're gonna make markets work perfectly. <laughs> You know, if that had been his message, he would have been a, a one-term president. He said, "I have a." He said, "I have a message of free. I'm going to increase your freedom, and that is your birthright as, as Americans." And um, uh, and Roosevelt had an altern uh, had a different notion of freedom, uh, and which and his notion of, notion of freedom went something like this: um, It used to be the case. This is what what Roosevelt would talk about that. Uh, Americans could get freedom on their own without government assistance. But industry has now become so concentrated, so powerful. There's such an imbalance between those who are rich and those who are poor. That those who are poor cannot achieve freedom without some kind of government assistance. So he cast the role of government as a means to assist people to enjoy their freedom. What's the meaning of freedom if you are poor and you can't afford a university education? What's the meaning of freedom if you are poor and you can't feed your children? What's the meaning of freedom if you're working in an industry and you're making minimum wage and can't support your family? And so his message was a different message of, of freedom which said in order for people to be truly free, they need certain forms of government assistance because without that government assistance, their freedom is a counterfeit freedom. It doesn't mean anything. It's just on the page. It, it doesn't exist in real life. So the New Deal had a story to tell that government was going to bring people greater personal freedom than they had heretofore enjoyed. I think my larger point, which I think accords with the, the, the question and the comment of the, the gentleman who asked the question, is that um, a, for a political order to succeed, it, must has, it, must ha it has to have a message that resonates deeply and powerfully, not just with economics, but with, what, with people's aspirations. And in America, people's aspirations at a certain point always have something to do with freedom and more secondarily with equality. Uh, and I think part of Biden's trouble, I, the, um, you know, I think Biden, uh, I'm a, um, I think Biden's had a good presidency under very difficult circumstances and he's done 
a lot to reorient American the American economy away from neoliberalism and something that um, promises a more just distribution of American resources and American wealth. But he's he has not found a narrative, a story with which he can persuade Americans that what he's doing is good. And that underscores the importance of, of, a, of not just a program of political economy, um, but um, a, st a, a story that goes along with it. And here's my favorite tr piece of trivia, which I like to ask whatever audience I'm talking to. Uh, you've heard about the infrastructure bill, a trillion dollar infrastructure bill that was passed two years ago. So my question to you, this is a trivia question of the night, but <laughs> like all good trivia questions, it it uh, reveals a, a more profound truth. How many infrastructural projects are currently underway in the United States? Okay, think of a trillion dollar infrastructure bill. It's been underway for let's say two years. How many how many projects are underway? How many infrastructural projects? Who wants to be brave and take a guess? Got nothing to lose. I'm hundreds of miles away. <laughs> but what would you guess? Someone in the middle with a beard is shaking his head left to right. What's what's your guess? You got a you got a number in mind. What do you think? How many? Anybody want to venture a guess? I'll be stupid enough to. <laughs> um, I want to say somewhere between like 300 and 35. Uh, yeah, three, I mean, somewhere between 35 and 300. 300. Yeah, I mean, it's like, I don't know. I thought that there was, a, a, you know, let's say like I can hear communities saying, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this, or in articles, and yet I don't know anything. I don't yeah. know. Look around me in Ann Arbor and see, you know, construction sites. Right. Your, your government's bringing you this. Right. Right. I'm getting this because of Biden. Okay. Three. So you, let's say, let's say, let's give you 300. Any other guesses? 300 is too low. We had two here. We were oh, muted, but we had one for zero. And one, for low. What, one for zero and one for what? 100. 100. Okay. Oh, one more. Any other guesses? I say a thousand. Thousand. Well, you're heading in the right direction. Really? Okay. Here, here's the answer. Forty-two thousand projects oh are underway. For forty-two thousand projects are underway. Now, some of these are small. Mm -hmm. I don't know how big your library is, but a couple. You know, some of them are a couple solar panels on the roofs of. Town libraries, you know, maybe five hundred thousand dollars, but others are one hundred million, two hundred million, five hundred million dollars. Um, the Biden administration has started forty-two thousand infrastructural projects in two years, and no one knows it. He he doesn't now. Part of it, Brooke, is where are the signs, right? You know this. Biden bringing, Biden bringing you infrastructure. But it shows the importance of having a story to go along with actual actual activity. Let me ask this, and then, then I do want to go to um, MJ, Mary, somebody's uh, question. But his, his, his people around him have known this for a long time. There have been a lot of people on talk shows who say, you know, he needs a story. Isn't that their job? And why aren't they doing this? Why aren't they putting out pamphlets? Why aren't they saying, Midwest, look at what's happened to you? Um, or Ohio, look at what West Virginia is doing. You ought to get up, you know, you too. Yeah. Can um, that's, that's, well, I mean, I think they are trying. Um, part of it is, is Biden himself does not project dynamism I, I don't i don't buy into the fact that he's demented or he's mentally addled i, I think he's very sharp but um and, and he's you know physically he's in good shape but his his face is old and it doesn't it doesn't he you know in terms of his words he doesn't project he doesn't command the stage i think that's part of it i another uh, I, another part of it is um uh 
the the media the media polarization the polarized media worlds in which which we live and how hard it is to break from one bubble to another or or you know penetrate a, a world that is constantly resisting and has the capacity to resist you and then the third part of it is i think they they haven't just haven't found the right storyline or message someone will find it and someone will break through but it hasn't it hasn't happened yet hasn't happened yet but it it's a it's a puzzle and i um uh i i've written a piece for a british media journal called unheard u n h e r d that um dropped this morning published this morning and the title is will um uh will bidenism outlast biden you know will all these initiatives that he has begun does do they have a future beyond 2024 if he loses and i i myself am, am i'm pu i'm puzzling this my i'm puzzling over this myself i don't have a good enough answer for you brooke given the uh the the very strong innovations and progress of the economy over the last few years he ought to be above a 30 he ought to be polling above 37 percent, which is you know which is where he is now inflation's a big problem inflation's been a big problem but he ought to be above 37 percent in terms of what he's uh, accomplished and elements of the message are simply not not getting through Okay, um, this is from uh, Mary Jackson. She's asking, I perceive a dichotomy between saying that the group you see dominating in the future sees a security role for government, and yet they are losing their minds over prosecution of people like them. What is the nuance I'm missing? They are losing their minds over prosecuting people like them. The that's the part I'm confused about. Be let me let me see if I can bring this up in the chat. Hold on a minute. And Mary, chat more if you can't talk. I'm, I'll stick in here. I, I'm guessing what she's saying is, if Trump is uh, looking for law and order, why does he have a problem when people are coming after him? When the law is coming after him? Um, I think it's a Republican question. Why Why do the Republicans dislike the law coming after them if they want to be the party of law and order? Um, the, um, I think the Trump has persuaded a, um, uh, an awful lot of people in America that um, institution of the institutions of law and order in this country have been corrupted uh, for a political purpose. Um, FBI, CIA, um, other uh, other sec security agencies, uh, and so if if I put myself in in their shoes. Um, they think that the uh, uh, the institutions that um, were set up constitutionally to defend law and order can no longer be relied on to do that work. And so people must take things into their own hands, which justifies a kind of insurrectionist mentality. You know, the only way to uh, save the Constitution is to assault the Capitol building. Uh, and um, this is how I, I mean, I, 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 I the, for me, the uh, assault on the Capitol uh, on January 6th is for me, one of the worst days of my life as an American. Um, a president authorizing essentially um, a group of his supporters to attack the people's house. Um, and uh, so the um, uh, it's, that's not a kind of behavior that I can 
accept. But if I try and put myself in their shoes, you know, someone who opposes those kinds of actions, and as a historian, try and understand their actions, their their justification is that the existing institutions have been corrupted to the point where only people seizing, the people themselves taking actions, even if they are um, illegal and perhaps violent, that this may be necessary to to bring about a, a rebirth of America and a proper appreciation for the constitution. It's, it speaks to the, in, in my view, the volatility of, and the dangers uh, of the moment that Americans, there are a lot of Americans who feel that such actions are justified to save the country from the corruption that has been visited upon it. And I disagree with that analysis profoundly, but it is part of the politics of our land right now. Um, and uh, uh, I think Trump himself has no regard for the Constitution. He has said as much. Um, I think some of his supporters do believe in the Constitution uh, and want to save the Constitution from those people who they think are assaulting it. But I think Trump himself um doesn't understand the constitution um doesn't understand the principles for which it stands that the people are sovereign as opposed to uh to one person um that separation of powers is important that you can't concentrate too much power in one individual or or one branch of government that power has has to be dispersed across the government for a system a system of checks and balances in order for liberty and democracy to be preserved. Um, these are um, uh, elements of the constitution, which I regard as very important, which I think um, Trump regards as distractions uh, and um, and not to be honored if they interfere with his quest for power. We have three more questions here. Please go ahead. Can can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, you, you talk about our, our uh, political orders and state of flux, um, to say the least. Um, and economic crisis usually ushers in um, a change in the political order. Um, I, I look around the globe and I'm just uh, astonished and amazed at whether it's Central America or Hungary or England or Africa, I don't, I don't care, this authoritarian thing is sweeping the globe, and I find it really odd that it's all happening at the same time. Is it all economic based? I mean, I've, I've been telling people it's, there's something in the water that's causing this, because how can this be? Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, I asked myself, how can it be? And yet it is being. <laughs> uh, the, um, the authoritarian threat is global. And if you look at the number of societies that now have leaders who are either authoritarian or would like to be authoritarian, it's a st staggering number. It's Trump in the US, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Orban in Hungary, Putin in Russia, Erdogan in Turkey, Netanyahu in Israel, Modi in India, Xi in China, until recently, Duarte in the in the in the Philippines, um, and uh, the I do think that um, a part of this is a uh, is a reaction to um, the neoliberal order, which was a, a global order, and and promised the world that uh, if you free capitalism to do its work um, uh, and created a world of free trade and, and free markets and free capitalism that all boats would rise and everyone would be better off. And I think there's um, a deep dissatisfaction uh, and anger that that has not been the world that has come to be. 
Uh, part of what the neoliberal order, global order produced were uh, corporations that are often more powerful than governments uh, and um, and able to bestride the, the global stage. I think of the amount of power that Elon Musk has, um, for example, uh, in so many different areas of life that um, affect us. I think there's, um, uh, and these, but these corporations are, have, have, and these individuals who control these corporations have become so powerful that uh, a lot of people have lost confidence in the ability of governments to solve problems uh, because the, the problems seem too big for national legislatures. In a way, in order to um, confront the power that many international corporations have, you need some kind of global parliament to contend with their global power. And yet all the experiments in global governance have failed. Uh, and there's a sense that the challenges that the world faces and that particular societies face are too complicated for national legislatures to solve. Um, and if you feel that national legis the national legislatures are the homes of, that's where democracies have been most successful. You think of Congress in the United States, you think of Parliament in Britain, you think of the National Assembly in France, you think of the Bundestag in, in Germany. Uh, during the heyday of democracy from the 40s to the 70s, uh, these were extremely effective legislative institutions. But the globalization of trade and corporations and economic activity uh, so far outstrips many of these national institutions, these national legislatures, that a lot of people in a lot of different places have lost confidence in the ability of societies to be self-governing. They have lost confidence that the actual institutions of government can can work to solve the problems that they face. And if you believe that um, government has become ineffective in the hands of national legislatures, uh, where the people are meant to be sovereign, but they can't solve any of their problems, what do you do in a situation like that? That makes the appeal of a strong man uh, much more appealing. And what does the strong man offer? strength, power, the promise that he will cut through all the red tape uh, and 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 all the bickering that's going on in these national legislatures, that he will be decisive, that he will act with the interests of the people at heart. Uh, and um, that's that's the world we inhabit right now, where a, a lot of people in a lot of different countries believe that the best way forward is for a strong man to come along and just cut through all the crap. We had a situation like that in the world in the 1930s, <clears throat> uh, when the numbers of functioning democracies in the world could be counted on two hands. <laughs> there were less than 10 of them. Uh, and the similar arguments were made, and the, the dictators of that time are familiar to you. Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin in Russia, a little bit later Mao in China, you know, strong leaders who would take charge of things and get things done, uh, opposition be damned. Um, and uh, the, de the democratic restoration, if we ask where did it start, and what was the most important country in the democratic revival that ended up coming out of the Second World War? It's the United States. That's where it began. Um, that's where democracy resurged. And out from the United States, it went to many more parts of the world. I'm not sure the United States can play that role again. 
uh, and we'll find out in 2024. Uh, it makes the 2024 election really, really important. I think Biden understands the stakes. But if Trump is elected in 2024, the notion of America being at the center of a global democratic resurgence, that idea is gone. And if that resurgence does not come from the United States, where does it come from? I don't have an answer to that question. <laughs> maybe some maybe some of you do. Uh, but these, uh, and my answer is a little rambling and long-winded, but that's a measure of the seriousness with which I take the global authoritarian challenge and um, not sh and and uh, and we may go through um, an authoritarian global phase across the next ten years. I find myself um, reading a lot about countries that lost their democracies and had to struggle to get them back. Why am I reading this? Because I think America may lose its democracy and may have to struggle to get it back. The bad news is that America may lose its democracy. The good news is if it loses its democracy, the struggle is not over. That ultimately democratic strivings, I believe, are irrepressible. And there are examples of other countries losing their democracy and reclaiming it at a later date. Um, Do you have some that you could share with us or send to us? Um, you know. Well, I think the the this um, the societies that I that I think are are most notable in that regard. One is Germany, hmm. um, which uh, had a functioning democracy destroyed by Hitler in the early '30s. And another that I'm quite interested in is Chile in um, South America, uh, which for much of the 20th century was known as um, Latin America's outstanding democracy. Lost that democracy in the 1970s um, under Pinochet, uh, who ruled it as an autocrat for 20 years. Uh, and then um, was removed from power in the 1990s, and Chile has been on a on a quite impressive struggle since the 1990s to reclaim its democracy. So uh, these are um, and uh, these are struggles that um, other countries have fought for. Uh, what makes it scary in the United States is that we've never had to fight in that way. And so we are, it puts us, it would put the United States in an unusual and uncomfortable position. But I do believe that the, the democratic character of the U.S. and the, the here's where values matter, that even if the government ceases to function in a democratic fashion, I think the values are so intensely entrenched in the United States that millions of Americans will fight to, to get it back. That... Um, is a hopeful, powerful place um, in a way to end a very serious conversation. Um, I am intrigued by it and um, wish we had more times and more opportunities with you, Gary, actually, to be quite quite blunt and quite straightforward. Um, oh, I mean, I, I do see it's it's our time now and I hesitate, but I think we need to close so you can go and do as you need um and we can too but um and people are saying in the, you know in the chat that it's been just a wonderful, <clears throat> wonderful conversation discussion um i uh i know i'm going to go go back to your book, um you know just reread re it again because there is so much more in there that um, you know that i didn't pick up um you know and that i know that is is in there even as much as i did so um, if there's anyone who would like to maybe ask one other brief question, we may have, let we'll give you that. Um, anyone? Hello, Judith. Hello. Well, I think, my, I think my question has been kind of answered. I just wanted to know what is Trump's message? Since Biden's message hasn't come through, what is Trump's, what do you think his messaging is? What what do I think Trump's message is? Um, yeah. Uh, that um, 
America has been um, cor corrupted by um, a deep state, by immigrants, um, uh, by Democrats, by socialists, by minorities um, who are... Um, well, his message has remained the same since his inaugural American carnage, that this is a land of carnage. Uh, and uh, he is going to make America great again. And uh, if he has to break a lot of heads in the process, he won't hesitate to do that. Um, I think uh, a lot of his supporters delight in his demonstration of power. Um uh, his um, his willingness to break rules. Uh, he has convinced people that the state of the country is so perilous that um, all kinds of means that were not once necessary may need to be deployed in order to restore America to its greatness. Um, I think that stands at the, in brief, that stands at the core of of his message. Yeah. I think of how democracies die, <laughs> kind of clicked one of their points. Yeah, I think um, I, I think our democracy is in danger. Um, and I think for those of you who care about it, fight for it, <clears throat> fight hard for it over the next uh, couple of years, the 2024 election is really, really important. And uh, uh, it's going to make a world of difference. I'm, a, I'm assuming Biden and Trump are going to be the two nominees. You know, a lot can happen. Mm -hmm. We're just at the beginning of the election season. But um, <clears throat> I'm, I have a cold. I'm still getting over, so I'm a little hoarse. The... Um, <clears throat> I'm assuming Biden and, and Trump will be the nominees and uh, uh, you know, the, de the democratic future of uh, the United States is at stake. Trump says he'll, he's now being asked whether he'll be a dictator and he's, he is witty <clears throat> saying I'll be a dictator for a day. That's a way of saying all I need is a day to make myself a more permanent dictator. So after that, I won't need to, to take action to be a dictator, I will. I I will be one. And he is also promising retribution and uh, revenge on his political opponents, who he finds everywhere. So um, it's a um, you know it's a it's a volatile, uh, frightening time for America. But I don't want to just conclude on a depressing note um, for this evening. It's important to recognize that throughout. American history, the United States has never missed an election. Even with all the wars it has fought, even in the Civil War, it carried on election after election. The, you know, the longest period of unbroken democratic rule of any country in the world. And that is supported by um, an array of deeply democratic institutions. And uh, uh, that is our 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 country's gift to us its historic gift and uh and that will not disappear even if um democracy gets temporarily suspended there's there's a history to work with here and that history will uh, allow those who wish to to carry on the struggle do you see hope in the amicus brief that was filed yesterday by three pages of former republican high-ranking officials saying that the president does not have permanent immunity for everything. I, mean, well, I, think, I, I think there's a good chance that the, um, the clearly Trump's strategy here is to delay any trial until he's actually president of the United States. Oh, and if that happens, he won't have to worry. Right. about about any of these trials and uh so i think the law is pretty if the supreme court agrees to hear this case there's a good chance they will rule in favor that 
they will they will rule that that Trump has to face prosecution. He, he's he's not exempt from it. But the question is whether they will agree to hear the case. Um, they they have issued a you know a preliminary indication that they might be willing to consider it. Uh, Trump's interest, I don't think his, his attorneys don't necessarily have to believe that they're going to win this case. They're really interested in delay, delay, uh, delay. Um, it's also important to recognize that his his hardcore base um, is about 30% of the voting public, um, and he can't win with that base alone. So uh, there's a large group of independents in this country who are, who are uh, and Republican moderates who probably are going to be decisive in this election. And um, there are not that many states that are up for grabs. And in, in given the polarization of the country, um, there's about five or six states that are going to decide, decide the election, probably again by slim margins. So every activity um, matters. I, I am pleased that Jack Smith has undertaken this aggressive strategy to, you know, to, uh, to get the Supreme Court to rule in the hope that then a trial can begin um, in, a, in a timely manner. Um, but um, the it, it may, there may not be enough time. There are going to be all kinds of opportunities for delay. And so, um, if we're thinking the trials are going to decide this election, that might be an incorrect view. Hmm. S sobering. It, it it is it is it is a it is a sobering time. Uh, but that's why I'm s stressing the history of the United States never having missed an election deeply rooted democratic institutions that have been under stress uh, but also have um, a lot of resourcefulness and um, it's going to be up to us and people like us to um, uh, try and um, make America the kind of country we want it to be so I want to encourage all of you to I suspect that you're here tonight means you're already thinking about yeah. these matters yeah. uh but you know encourage your friends your family your enemies to you know the this, <laughs> this uh this election is is crucial it's vital and uh you know have to have to bend every arm to to um try and produce a good result absolutely i really appreciate um your being with us tonight um, and, uh, and, and sharing so much. So, My pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Happy holidays to all of you. And um, I'm very pleased that you have this kind of program underway.